we call that E of T. So we created this new variable E of T multiplied by delta T. So it's, it's got the same meaning over here. So it's a fractional tracer leaving in the period of time delta T. We went through a bit of a derivation last time also then and showed that that E of T can be expressed in another way. In fact, it's equal to C of T multiplied by the volumetric flow rate of E our reactor at divided by the integral from 0 to infinity of C of T multiplied by Q dt. And that simplifies out to C of T divided by this integral from 0 to infinity of C T dt if Q is, if Q is equal to uh, constant throughout the reactor. So, uh, sorry, if Q is equal to constant value throughout the duration of our experiment. Which is typical. So if we aim to maintain a constant flow rate Q throughout the time that we run that experiment. So let's just take a look at this uh, term over here. It's a ratio of a function, C of t, these are concentrations we measure over time, divided by the total integrated value of that concentration multiplied by dt. So if we had to consider conceptually what's going on here, we're going to get a curve over time of C of t values. And it may look something like that. This total area under the curve is equal to that integral over there in the denominator. So that area is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of C of t and dt. Now all that E of t is, is a rescaling of this curve. So I simply take C of t, that curve, and I just divide it by this denominator. This denominator is just a constant. Once I evaluate that integral, it's a known fixed value, it stays the same. And so all that E of t is, is essentially, it's got exactly the same shape as C of t, but it's just rescaled down on the y-axis. So I'm simply just changing what my y-axis looks like. The same shape. C of t. Just the only difference is that now the area under this curve is equal to 1. This denominator here is equal to n of six. Yeah, we derived that last time. So last time we derived this denominator here is equal to n of six. material I've added to my, um, to my reactor over the duration of the experiment. But if I don't know it, and in some cases that is true, we're just adding our trace so that we don't actually know, or we might not even be able to measure how much trace we're injected over here, I can still get and recover N0 from the integral of the area. Okay. Okay. No, the area is equal to exactly one because E of T is the C of T's curve just divided through by the total area of C of T. So the area under this curve, if I take that curve and divide by the area under the curve, then the area now is normalized to area of one. So if I had to go integrate E of T, I would give that kind of area. Oh, 
Okay, so how is that helpful? Well, it's going to play into this definition here. The definition of E of T is the fraction of tracer leaving the reactor in a period of delta T. So I can say that as I know my E of T curve, I know how long a certain material stays in the reactor for which proportion of time, for which fraction. And that's exactly what we want to know. We're going to see that now. We're going to compare my E of T curve versus the theoretical E of T curve for what a reactor should get. And we're going to be able to tell what's going wrong with our reactor. So we're going to see a few examples of that in a minute. So let's take that uh, E of T curve then and just uh, quickly just take a look at the units of it. And then we'll move into this example that's on your handout in front of you. So C of T has units of moles per meter cubed. That would imply that the integral from 0 to infinity of C of T dt, that has units of moles per meter cubed times time. So the integral is the product of those, is the product of C of t and the variable that you're integrating with respect to. So then the units of E of t are the units of C of t divided through by this integral unit. So that's if we if we look at those units, it would be moles per meter cubed divided by moles per meter cubed multiplied by seconds. So that simplifies to units of 1 over seconds. So that's important when we're dealing with these exercises that we're Make, oh, when we're dealing with residence time distributions, that we make sure that our units are what we expect to get. So let's take a look then at that example that's in the in the handout in front of you. If you flip over the page. The aim of this example is just to find at least initially what P of T is. So we're all we can measure from our reactor is concentration over time. Let's find what E of T is, and then we're going to use that E of T curve to find E of T. That's the first step. And then next is use it to, to find the fraction of material that spends three minutes or less in the reactor. injecting a pulse right at time zero of a certain amount of, of tracer and then this is the corresponding concentration we measure leaving the reactor as a function of time. So would you say this reactor is a CSTR or a EFR if you didn't know? I mean in practice we obviously know what, what our reactors are but just looking at this curve what type of reactor would you say this is? So the approach is to write out your data as follows, the time is C of T, and then we find the area under curve, 
we're going to integrate the area under the C of T curve, and then we're going to calculate E of T. And then we can answer those questions. So I'll try out for the first few data points. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 minutes. This is obviously something you would normally do on a computer, but uh, let's just work through the first few steps by hand here. The C of T values recorded right at time 0 when we make that false injection. Obviously, we're not able to measure anything leaving the reactor, but after one minute, we do measure a concentration of one. In this case, the units are uh, grams, grams per meter cubed for C of T. So grams per meter cubed. After two minutes, we measure five, then eight, and then ten grams per meter cubed. And that's really the peak, and then it starts to tail off after that. So area under curve, this first segment, uh, you can simply just use the trapezoidal rule. So trapezoidal rule is the half, the sum of the two heights. The first case, that's uh, equal to half of 0 plus 1, 2.5. The second segment over there is half of 1 plus 5, 6, 3. The next one is half of 5 plus 8. And then the next segment is half of 8 plus 10. So you can sum up those areas under the curve one, one segment at a time. You can use more sophisticated integration formula as well, um, Simpson's rules and so forth. Those are all equally valid. But this is a, a crude and quick one. So if you Sum that up, you'll get uh, 49.3, let's just call it 50, that's not the area under my curve. So that area under curve will be 50, which are the units, in this case would be grams per meter cubed, multiplied by minutes. So it's the units of C multiplied by the units of time. E of T that is equal to CT divided by that total area under the curve. So we've just integrated from 0 to infinity here. Pretty much after time 15 or 14, this curve stays 0. So if we integrate to infinity, we are uh, really not doing anything much after the 14th data point. So E of T then is equal to or C of T divided by This term over here so the is that denominator, so E of T is just C of T divided through 0, 50, 0. The next portion is 150th. <laughs> back to my original question is what is the what fraction of the material spends three minutes or less in the reactor? 49.3 rounds. the area the area still runs? That's what the whole of So what is the fraction of material that spends three minutes or less in the reactor?
Interpretation holds exactly in the same way. So it's the fraction of material that spans between time one and time two units of time. So whatever that might be, seconds or minutes, depending on your frame. So a fraction of material that spans between time one and time two units of time in the reactor. Okay. So in the same way, this is spending from time t equals t to t equals t plus delta t. Okay, that's exactly what this is saying over there. It's going from time some general time t to some general time t plus delta t. Well, we can do the same thing. We can give those concrete names, call that t1 and t2, and the, the meaning is exactly the same. So if we come back and try to answer our question here, what's the fraction of material that's spaced between 0 and 3 minutes in the reactor? Thank you. 
that output curve to be for a CSTR and for a PFR. CSTRs and PFRs, let's assume they are actually true and old. What would that curve look like for a CSTR and PFR? Now, I've written E of T here. You can just write that as C of T. All that the E of T curve is, here, let's take a look, is this example we just worked through. This is the E of T curve. It's identical in shape and appearance to C of T. It's simply all that happens is we rescale the y axis. So when you're following these curves over here, don't worry about E of T, you can call the C of T. If I put this concentration into my reactor, what would be the corresponding concentration leaving a CSTR and a PFR? So discuss with the person next to you and draw what you think those curves would look like. is now diluted through a whole bunch of material volume V. So 
But one might go to the same height as the pulse, and then it will just decay exponentially to zero. So let me decay it down to zero. Okay, so that's the ideal CSTR and ideal PFR profiles in red. Let's take a look though at what happens with actual reactors. So an actual reactor for a plug flow, what you'll tend to find is a pretty good plug flow reactor, you'd find that what happens is you get a normal distribution type shape around it. So that, that comes about because the material here at the front is due to some what we say is dead volume in the reactor. So if I draw my reactor out here, I'm going to have regions over here and often over here, right at the entry and sometimes over here at the exit. These regions are called dead volume. They serve to reduce the volume of the reactor. This is just parts that sit almost stagnant. So the true reactor volume is actually smaller than what I think it is. So I've got this constant velocity coming in through a smaller volume. That's this material that's leaving at the front. So it actually comes out earlier than I would have otherwise expected. If I'm channeling, so if this is a pack bed, for example, and I've got parts of the pack bed that are pretty open, allowing the fluid to channel through there, I can also see um, I can also see some of this material leaving over there, so bypassing the channel. If then I would have, I have other material that lags behind it, it would come out after. So, so certain reactors, depending on how much dead volume and channeling are, this, will, this distribution will shift relative to that point of So we can see some, on some reactors, this would be your theoretical location for tau. On some reactors, you might see this pulse coming out much, much sooner than you expect. So it's not actually centered where you expect. So if you do get it close to your theoretical tau, you've actually got a pretty good plug flow reactor. Very often, we see it shifted um, much, much earlier, indicating that material is spending a shorter time in the reactor than what we hope for, and we're probably going to, or we will, get lower conversions than we would otherwise what would a CSTR look like that has dead zones? So it's got parts of the reactor which are stagnant, which we often see again in the corner region. So here's my mixing. If I don't have baffles, I'll often find these regions here of dead zones. How, how would that show up in this E of T plot? This is material that's staying in the reactor much, much longer than it normally would. What do you expect that red curve to look like instead? Observe this uh, 
phenomena are called bypassing. So if you've got uh, my material flowing in and my material leaving over here again, some of this material spends a very short time in the reactor and it just, it just goes right out again. Okay, so that, that, those problems also show up in these residences. So you'll, you'll almost never see this perfect red curves for these two instances. You'll see something like the blue and green curves more, more commonly. <coughs> and then uh, just this, uh, here's another final important point that uh, we should make. Um, you may remember from statistics courses or from your calculus courses, you can derive this general rule that the integral from 0 to infinity of x multiplied by f of x dx divided by the integral from 0 to infinity of f of x dx. So this is called the first moment of a function x, of a function f, I should say. And that's called the mean of the function. So that's a, that's a, a rule that um, we know from before. Well, we can do the same thing with um, <coughs> integrals of e of t. We can integrate from 0 to infinity of t multiplied by e of t in t. We can divide that by the integral from 0 to infinity of e of t. That's the average. So t multiplied by e of t. You can call that tm. So that's the average time the particle spends in the reactor. The interesting thing is that that de denominator here, the integral from 0 to infinity of e of t cancels out to, or simplifies down to 1. So the integral of t multiplied by e of t from 0 to infinity is equal to this definition of tf. And one, one interesting point is that for for a theoretical CSTR, Tm is equal to tau, which is the residence time. So early on in the course we called the tau uh, residence time. Then we corrected that and we said, well, a better name for tau is space time. Um, it's actually a more accurate representation. But uh, the term residence time does hold. The residence time, then, you can now interpret in another way as well. It's the average time a particle spends in the reactor. So tau the average time we had interpreted as the time to replace the volume of the CSTR. So in our CSTR we had we were feeding it and taking out the material. There's a volume V. We were feeding it with volumetric flow rate Q. It has volume V. So tau we defined as V over Q. So the time taken to replace that volume with new material coming in at flow rate Q. But tau also has this great interpretation of the average time a particle will spend in the reactor. And then what's interesting is for a theoretical CSTR, this peak over here that it will reach is 1 over tau. So 
if you're substituting the equation for the, uh, you do a mass balance on CSTI and you pump it as theoretical E of T curve, that point which it reaches up to is 1 over tau. And for a, for a CSTR, that curve is E of T is equal to E to the minus T over tau divided by tau. Which at time 0, for T equals 0, that simplifies down to 1 over tau. And for those of you taking uh, process control right now with Dr. Schwartz, um, the theoretical curve for a plug flow reactor is the Dirac delta function delta t minus tau. So if you're not taking process control or you don't remember what the delta function looks like from the second to help this course, uh, don't worry, it's just more for interest than you, you know that. Which, is that. which says exactly what we see over there. It says um, that that output from the PFR is the spike, the delta function. Okay, so this section then, just to wrap up, is really a way we just looked at a basic introduction of how we can judge the non-ideal behavior in the reactor. We use these plots, these studies are done in practice, and then these plots are used to, to estimate how much backfixing, sorry, how much bypassing and channeling occurs in a reactor. And if a lot of if, if, if this curve is a really non-ideal, we may make changes to the reactor to make it closer to ideal behavior and then follow us afterwards.